Howdy y'all, welcome back. Thank you for 78,000 subscribers. Every single one of you in your comments means the world to this channel. Today, we're going to look at a vast assortment of photographs related to lighter than air travel, dirigibles, balloons, and even some zeppelins of the old world. The balloon has often been one of my favorite topics of the old world to discuss. When these balloons were powered with engines and able to be navigated, they became known as dirigibles, which themselves then advanced into the vastly superior Zeppelin. In a matter of roughly 200 years, it appears, this lighter-than-air technology, which shaped our earliest air travel, had reached its apex, only to be surpassed by heavier-than-air travel. Throughout my videos that I've made in the last three years or so, over 200 of them, in each one, we look at hundreds of different photographs of major cities all around the world. And in many of these most famous cities, we will find things that are called mooring stations, literal docking stations for the airships and the dirigibles of the old world. It makes you begin to question just how advanced this technology was and how often it was really being used. Now, as these airships began to advance from balloons into dirigibles into much more advanced technology. This technology began to be used for nefarious purposes. The governments around the world adopted these airships to be used during wartime. According to the narrative that we have today, the first intercontinental weapon ever created was a balloon. Furthermore, these balloons were unmanned vessels, apparently sent into the jet stream by a sophisticated timer and apparatus setup. These were known as fire balloons. These incendiary balloons were utilized by Japan during World War II, according to the narrative. The unmanned and uncontrolled balloons were carried over the Pacific Ocean from Japan to North America by fast, high altitude air currents utilizing a sophisticated sandbag ballast system to maintain altitude. The fire balloons were intended during World War II to ignite large-scale forest fires, but even more so to ignite panic. Does this sound like any stories we've heard recently in the news of mysterious balloons? Diving into the schematics and details briefly of the fire balloon, Symbolism in the numbers becomes apparent. The balloon program of Japan was said to have begun in 1933, but was abandoned or made secret shortly thereafter, before being reinstated during World War II. The hydrogen-filled paper balloons measured 33 feet in diameter, with four 11-pound incendiaries, as well as one 33 pound larger device as the balloon's overall payload. Here is where we get to a bit of an anomaly in the history. According to the Japanese historical narrative, over 9,000 of these fire balloons were built and launched from what America now calls Dragonfly Island. However, the alphabet agents of the United States worked extensively to suppress news stories of these Japanese fire balloons landing in America. When we look at the accepted American history or the accepted American narrative, only one of these fire balloons ever reached down and achieved any sort of impact in America. This occurred on May the 5th, 1945 in the state of Oregon. During this, fire ballooning. Six American civilians lost their lives, becoming the first and only civilians to do so in the continental United States from a result of an enemy war attack during World War II. As we look through these balloons, which we know from different narratives dating as far back as the 1800s were used for such things as surveillance, we also have other aspects of the balloon that I'd like to get into. Mm -hmm. 
taking this a step further into the proverbial shadow of modern air travel, the first dirigible or powered and steerable airship to make a successful flight, according to most narratives, was the Giffard airship, which became known as the Giffard dirigible. Built in 1852, the outline for this extravagant vessel has become synonymous with old world air travel, often showcased in one form or another in many of the depictions of cutting edge technology of the late 19th century. However, this Giffard airship and dirigible dates much earlier than that. This was the first airship to have a true pilot, in this case being Henri Giffard himself, a pioneering French engineer who, besides designing, crafting, creating, and piloting the world's first dirigible, also invented the steam injector, a precursor to modern day fuel injectors and a key component to the industrial revolution. The steam injector is considered by many to have led the way for multiple engine advancements of the industrial age and the industrial revolution, while the Giffard dirigible quite literally pioneered steering within air travel, leading to, amongst other things, the ideas that became the modern airplane. Now diving back into the Giffard airship pictured in the top left here, this piece of Antiquitech was said to be quite immense, needing a large amount of distance from where the engine was located precariously mounted, hanging below the abundantly larger balloon above. The balloon itself measured 44 meters or 144 feet 4 inches. The volume of the Vesica Pisces shaped balloon was 300 meters cubed or 10,600 cubic feet, equipped with one steam-powered engine producing upwards of three horsepower. Somewhat amazingly, Giffard, being the architect of the craft, was also the only man to fly the vessel. In doing so, Giffard actually refueled the steam engine mid-flight, having had to do so at least twice during the Giffard dirigible's most famous flight its maiden voyage from the Hippodrome in Paris to Ellencourt, a commune over 17 miles away. This first flight of the Giffard airship took place on September 24, 1852, and took approximately three hours. The ship's mesmerizing design had many influential features which would go on to inspire the onslaught of other dirigibles that conquered the skies during the late 1800s. The Giffard dirigible had an engine exhaust which was diverted downwards to a long pipe projecting below the platform, and the area surrounding the boiler stokehole was encapsulated by wire gauze. The craft featured an elongated, almost football-shaped envelope or body of the balloon. From this was suspended a long beam with a triangular sail-like rudder as in the similar steam-powered ships or steamboats which had only recently begun to conquer the lakes and seas of the world. At the aft end of the Giffard airship and beneath the beam a platform for the pilot and the steam engine hung. The Giffard dirigible had a top speed of over 6 miles or 9 kilometers per hour, however, the range of the three horsepower steam engine was only five miles, requiring Giffard to refuel the engine mid-flight, a seemingly dangerous task, only amplified by the fact that Giffard's dirigible was the very first of its kind to ever conquer the skies. I think the last aspect worth mentioning in this overall narrative is that this time period of the mid-1800s, and even for many years before that, the language of business, the language of trade, the language of the elite of the world 
was French. It was taught in these private schools and it became something that was synonymous with the upper class. Now to go hand in hand with that, we also have numerous individuals, numerous engineers, architects, people like Robert Fulton and Benjamin Franklin who would go to Paris, who would go to France, and then afterwards, they would come up with these inventions that would change the world. And I find that to be so interesting, especially when we consider the life of Henri Jaffar. Because towards the end years, we're told he began to lose his eyesight before becoming almost completely blind. When this occurred, it is written that he took his own life, leaving all of his blueprints, all of his creations, everything that was his life's work to the country of France. As always, please like, share, and subscribe, but to end this video, I wanted to do something a little bit different. Now, in the comments on every video, I have some people who ask, how do you know that these photographs are authentic and unaltered? And really, all we have to go on when we look at the old world is the information that's been provided to us from the private collectors, the museums, and those who provide these photographs. What we know about them is what we have written and what we can deduce with our own eyes. Now, many people ask about this AI photograph or the AI technology. Well, to end this video will be five or six of the creepiest AI created photographs of the old world that I've come across. Let me know what you think in the comments down below and I'll see you on the next video. Cheers, y'all.